Hello, hello. Good morning. A rare AM edition of uh, Day Drinking here. We're very, very excited to welcome Richard Urquhart of Gordon McPhail and Gordon and McPhail and Ben Romack Distillery in sunny, sunny Scotland. I'm sure he'll be over soon. Uh, we're going to, we're going to amazingly take a little tour through their facility in Elgin, uh, in the very north of Scotland. Um, and, and then talk a bit about what they do. They're a very unique company. You know, one of the more prominent, here's Richard, uh, Mr. Urquhart unable to join. I don't know what that's about. You may have to get on to the, uh, the old Wi-Fi or we the Wi-Fi, as they say. Uh, and uh, so uh, let's see. Just seeing how we should join. Typically, typically, if you're on the Wi-Fi, you should be able to just, uh, I could just invite you. If you're on a cellular, sometimes it doesn't have the juice needed. Let me invite you anyhow. Uh, uh, here we are. See if that goes. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, well, Richard is not able to join still. I'll just continue to talk about Gordon McPhail until we figure that out. Um, it is, well, anyway, it's a really, really special company. They've had you know, centuries of history bottling scotch. We'll talk, talk more about that once we figure out the uh, technical side of these wonderful things. Uh, Mr. Tilbury's here. Nice. Um, they've recently changed importers in the United States. And for the very first time, I mean, in a decade of working together, we finally figured out how to do single casks is really really exciting there's also a, an upcoming package change you can see the the old style bottle for ben romack behind me i'm sure we'll talk about this too they've totally revamped it uh, very very cool new package uh still unable to join um i'm gonna ask uh i'll ask a good old caruso if he can figure something out here um and yeah, we visited several times. Um, you know, we pass by Elgin pretty regularly when we're when we're up there. Um, it's not very far from Abelour and sort of the heart of Speyside. So we like to pop by and say hi to, to uh, Gordon McPhail, even though in the past we've um, uh, we've yeah new new uh, they, they actually own the uh, the Ben Romack distillery. We, we've never we've never managed to do a single barrel until this year. Um, I hate how these are backwards. I don't know why everything's flipped on IG. Someone needs to fix that. But um, here we go. Go live. It's all happening. Um, yeehaw. And, and Elgin is this fun little town. It's pretty bustling and we just love hey there he is Richard it's great to see you man hi how are you <laughs> oh, I'm so well I'm having a perfect morning if you couldn't tell uh oh have we lost you already no there we're back um cool man we were trying drawing on our laptop but that doesn't work for Instagram live it would seem so we're back to using oh mobile. yeah yeah, yeah. You... yeah it's it's mobile only on this fabulous platform of ours it's kind of silly but it'll uh It'll work out. It'll work out. Uh, yeah. How are you, man? Everything good up in uh, sunny, sunny Elgin there? Yeah, it's um, a new normal up here, but yeah, we're all well and working away, trying to get some whiskey over to the States and to other countries. Very good. Well, we and, um, are so, so excited for what you guys are doing these days and um, super, super psyched about the new partners on this side. We've uh, had a good relationship with all those guys and making it work. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about Gordon McPhail and, um, and the, the history and the origins and then, and then we'll kind of speed up to where, where we are today? Yeah, um, so I'll also just mention that I've got David King with me here today as well. Oh, so. no way. How's it going? Oh. Like a bad David. penny, I always turn up somewhere. <laughs> and here we um, are. 
we we we're we're blessed to have you. What a what a pleasure. Look at you. Well, you know, it's funny because I've I've got my old Glenrothes pen here from when I worked for Glenrothes, and uh, I've got a Ben Romick notebook, and I think my liver's got about 130 distilleries attached to it, one way or another. <laughs> so we're delighted to be here. And well, I've got, if you got easy access to them now, huh? You just walk down the down the road, and you you're you're, you're well, sitting in front of 130 different distilleries right there in the warehouses. That's right, and uh, I think the plan is that uh, Richard will maybe give you a little look around there. Uh, and I've got a couple of uh, whiskies we can talk about, maybe not taste together, and we'll try and sync it so that uh, Richard's talking, and when he's walking, I can talk, and we can kind of make the whole thing flow a little bit better. So as soon as I get my uh, cellular phone uh, sorted out, we will be uh, we'll be together. So looking forward to it, and always a pleasure to talk to our friends in the states. I miss it badly, I have to tell you, although um, being tough for you guys this year, super yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah, it's not fun over here. I mean, I'm having fun, but um, very much by myself. So, uh, you know, I, I think, it, yeah, it is what it is. We're, you know, we're getting through it. Um, it, it can't last forever. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's not been, the, it's not been the, the easiest road. Luckily, people are still drinking, so I still have a job, so that's pretty sweet. Uh, and, you know, we're selling more scotch than ever, which is great to hear. Um, you, you know... Scotland uh, is definitely something I miss desperately. So I've, I'm feeling you. I, you know, I've been you come and visit as soon as you can. But we're the same way. I mean, I'm needing a bit of touch of California, and I'm sure you're needing a touch of Speyside. So let's see if we can get that organised no sooner rather than later. We're we're missing all of the friends who visit us over here. The distilleries, all the visitor centres are shut. Um, yeah. The COVID thing. Our first minister's taking it really seriously. Uh, right. which is good because we have uh, no deaths here. There's been no deaths in Murray at all, which That's is wild. great. Well, yeah. it's amazing, right? I mean, it's the safest place on mainland Britain to be. And uh, I, I just think that COVID had one look at single malt whiskey and realized it couldn't compete. <laughs> I'm also in there. We'll kick COVID's ass with single malt. That's what we said. Well, and, and you know, Scotland, you already have quite a bit of space. You're not on top of each other there. So uh, that's probably good for... Uh, for the for transmission rates, uh, but uh, I'm glad that you guys are still still trucking along down there, and and, and I really appreciate you coming out to do this. Um, I do want to uh, say thank you for these new samples. I don't know who pulled these; they're amazing. This is uh, we'll talk about those later, but so excited about doing single barrels finally. You you you. I remember we sat across from each other, and you said, "I'm going to figure out how we're going to do this." Well, that's right. And here we are. You did it. You did it. That's good. Well, it's all good. Team effort and all that. So um, anyway, go back to Richard. Maybe we'll figure out how I can get a separate screen up on there. Yeah. On Instagram. I don't think we can do two uh, at once, but, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we, you might be able to bang back and forth depending on where you are. Um, anyway, we're pretty loosey-goosey. We have an hour to kill here, and uh, um, I'm just happy to hang with you guys. So, uh, yeah, Richard, please tell us, of, tell us about, um, about your family's company and, and how, how, uh, how it all started and when the Urquharts got involved and what, what, it, what, it, what it's all about over there. Oh, we may have lost you. Yeah. All right. There we are. There we go. I didn't get it. Yeah, I think I got that. So, so we're sitting in what we call our generations room um, at our head office. And this room is quite, quite good because it gives you a whole kind of um, family history, company history. And you can see some of our old library um, whiskeys and samples behind me. So what I'll do is I'll take you back to the very beginning. So... This wall here covers basically the first generation of my family in the business. So this is John Urker, who joined the business when it first opened in the first year of trading in 1895. Wow. Are you hearing me okay? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The business itself opened on the 24th of May, 1895. Um, and that was um, our opening statement that went to the local newspaper up here. So we've been... Cool in business now for over 125 years. And my family's been involved pretty much for that entire 125 years of that as well. 
And it was a grocer at first, right? It, it, yeah. That's a market. So if you see down here, we were a family grocers that did tea, wine, and we were also a spirit merchant. All life's most important things. Yeah. And back then, we would um, blend whiskeys, blend teas, blend coffees. But we'd also um, fill whiskeys at the same time and not mm -hmm. always be able to, single, um, to blend. We started to bottle whiskey under license for some local distilleries like Glenlivet, like McAllen, Longmore and Mortal, like a lot of the distilleries we have, those old distillery labels for. We were actually bottling under license at that point. So when my great grandfather joined, he was very much um, the apprentice to James Gordon, one of our founders. So John McPhail looked after the grocery business and James Gordon looked after the whiskey side. And that's where the name Gordon and McPhail comes from. Nice. So James Gordon um, taught my great grandfather everything he knew about Scotch whiskey. And that really got my family into Scotch whiskey after that point. Um, after my great grandfather took over the business in 1915, um, we really started to focus on single malt whiskey and bottling whiskeys under license from distilleries. And at that time, no one was really bottling single malt. Most of the whiskey consumed was blended whiskey. So it was actually quite strange and quite different to be focusing on single malt whiskey. So moving on, in 1933, my, great, my grandfather joined the business um, and he then took over the business in 1956. You may have seen last year that we launched a centenary bottling for my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And that was um, distilled in the same year that my grandfather became the sole owner of the business in 1956. Wow. So he, when my grandfather joined, he became the, the apprentice to his father. And he really started to focus on single malt whiskey as well. And he actually released our first range of own label whiskeys, which was Conscious Choice, which we'll try a bit later on. Um, and that was the first time we didn't bottle whiskey under license, but bottled whiskey under our own name, under the Go McPhail label and name. Wow. So one point, point I'll always kind of try and make sure gets across is what makes Go McPhail different? Go McPhail doesn't buy mature whiskey. We fill our own casks at distilleries. That's our real kind of point of difference. So I'll turn this back onto me for this part. So we focus on sending our own casks that we source from Spain or from America to distilleries and fill it with their brand new, brand new spirit. And that is um, how we can lay down stock for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And the oldest so far is 75 years. Wow. Um, and we've got some of those bottles over behind me over there as well. And we'll go and have a look at them in a, in a short while. One, I think it's important to highlight how unique that is because those relationships exist because you've been doing this for decades. Yeah. And you can't just call up, you know, a distillery and be like, hey, I'd like a filling contract. Can you throw one my way? That's not yeah. a thing anymore. But also, if you want to have 50-year-old whiskey, you had to have that idea 50 years ago. No you kidding. Yeah. Year whiskey, you had to go back 75 years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for my great-grandfather and my grandfather, there was definitely a feeling that everyone thought they were eccentric. Why would you hold back whiskey to mature for single malt when you can actually blend it and sell it at a much younger age and make almost the same money for it? Mm. Because back then, there wasn't the same differentiation in price between blend and single malt. Right. right. These days, that belief that my great-grandfather, grandfather, my family has had means that we have the oldest and the largest age portfolio of single malt whiskey in the world. We have over 100 distilleries represented in our portfolio. And we have stock from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. So nine decades worth of stock still wow. maturing. And that is really suited to being a family business because you don't think about the next five years or the next 20 years. You think generations ahead. Right. And you're very grateful about the stock and the business, the way it's been run in the past, because that gives us the opportunities that we have in the future. So moving on down the, the wall, just to the next person is my uncle Ian. So he joined in the 1960s and looked after the production side of the business and was managing director for a big chunk of that time as well. But mm -hmm. retired in 2007. As you can see behind him there in his picture, um, it's got Ben Womack Distillery because he was heavily involved in bringing Ben Womack back to life. And mm -hmm. that was obviously the first distillery that we, um, that we have owned and run by ourselves. But we are actually in the process of building our second distillery, which will be a complete new build, which I'll come and try and sell you something in about 10 years' time. When you, have <laughs> you know we'll be buying. So that's a, a long-term project to be invest um, in the future and future generations of our, of our family, but the business as well. And you guys took over that distillery in the mid-90s, right? Yeah, in 1993, and 1990. we opened it in 1998. So um, uh, 22 years ago now. 
So we will have a new expression coming out, which will be from the 20, well, um, from 20, or 21-year-old, which will come out in a couple of months' time. So that will be um, the next kind of core expression that you'll see coming from the binomial portfolio. Lovely. And this is just one of the casks that we don't have anymore, but this was the first uh, generations cask we did, uh, 1938 wow. Mortlark, that we launched as a 70-year-old back in awesome. 2010. That is gorgeous. That is gorgeous. How, how many casks do you guys have aging in the warehouse currently? So on site here, we can store 8,000 casks on site. Um, and, we can, um, and we've got stock out of the series throughout uh, Scotland as well. So approximately, okay. I'd say we've got about 16,000, but it varies year on year, depending on how much we lay down. We always try and put more back in than we take out. Yeah. So next up in the family history is my, um, is my aunt. Um, she joined the business as well um, and worked in this kind of sales and marketing role um, up until uh, the 2000s, I think it was. Um, but again, she was very much um, involved with some of the archive stuff you'll see behind there. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. Very cool. My dad... He looked after our UK business. And that's actually where David um, King and I um, came across Gold McPhail initially. It was um, back in some of those old Curtis Hart days. And then you've got my Uncle Michael that some of you may have met before. He used to go to the US quite a lot. Um, and as you can see there, always makes me laugh. Everyone's picture has something that meant a lot to them. So for Michael, you've got passports, you've got the keepers, and you've got some of the older generations buttons there as well. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, so that's a brief overview of the family history. And then I guess taking you through some of our products we have and then to generations. And then I'm going to pass you over to David while I go and get us up for this tour. Lovely. So let me see if I can get a better wide shot of some of this stuff. So if we start down here. So what makes Gold McPhail quite special is we have this liquid library of cast samples. So some of these samples go back to the 20s and 1930s. Um, and some of these casts have been bottled, but some of these casts haven't been bottled yet. So we can see how maturation has affected the whiskey over a great length of time, but also see how distillery character has changed over that time as well. So some of the interesting ones here, I mean, that's a Glenlivet from 1962. And that was drawn as a, in 1970. So that's just an eight-year-old cast sample. Wow, you look at the color of that. Dark it is. Yeah. That is nuts. So, some older ones here. That is a 1954 Glen Murray. Uh, no, that's from Glen Murray, but that's a Glen Rothis cask. Nuts. So, we have this unique position of having these samples from so many different distilleries that we can really see how maturation is, has changed the product, but also how distillery character has changed at that time. Some of our mm. kind of older labels that you might be familiar with is some of like these old Macallan labels back from when we were a licensed bottle yeah. for Macallan back in the 30s. We now bottle Macallan under our spay malt label, which you will see coming back into the US as well um, in the near future. And then we have some of our mainstays, kind of I our think... link route. Well, and, and these these distillery labels, I think, are such so unique and and special, and um, and it's I think it really is what it highlights how different Gordon McPhail is from other independent bottlers, um, and all, obviously the juice is exquisite. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's what really makes us different is the fact that we have these long-standing relationships that we can use some of these old labels. Mm -hmm. No other independent bottler can use labels from that period of time. So yeah. we've got a very privileged position in the industry where we have these relationships, where we have to respect how we produce the whiskeys to make sure that we, everyone's happy with what we're doing. And yeah. here's some of our older cast strength labels. So we very bottle cool. for you about 300 different expressions a year, um, aging from 70 to 13-year-old, 12, 11-year-old whiskeys. But every product that we release <laughs> will always have a years old or a vintage on it. So it's always got very explicit about how old our whiskeys are. But I'm conscious of time, and I can talk for hours on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass you over to David, um, if he will be able to answer any questions while I get set up to do the cask um, warehouse tour. Just make sure I can speak on it. Yeah. 
Um, so we'll get David's help just now. Uh, and this is actually really exciting. This is the if, first virtual if tour he, if, of if the Cask Warehouse ever. So this is a, a, a new moment in, <laughs> in virtual experiences I, for Go McPhail. So it's cool. you guys are, are guinea pigs. So hopefully... <laughs> we'll Let's hope the Wi-Fi work. works down there. Uh, yeah. Do you want to... You want me to go invite David on, on, and you can keep your phone with you? Is he is he right, set up for for that? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, he's got yeah, his uh, phone out and waiting, so he's ready to go. I'm on All right, I'm very good. Just, yeah. I'm, I'm in, I'm yeah. What's your handle, David? Uh, I think I'm David King one seven six four or something. There'll only be one David King on it. I'm watching it as we go here. David King, one, seven, six, four. Here we are. All right, I'm gonna kick you off, Richard. Okay. I'll see you in a bit. Yeah. First ever. That's k &L. that's what we like. We like to be the first and the best. Uh, David is coming. Two Davids. Hello. Hello, hello. Here we are this again. This is fun. Here we, we're back. We're back again. We're back. So um, Richard is now going to, I'd, I'd like to say he was going to run, but that might be pushing the envelope. Yeah. We're in no super hurry. It's all right. He, uh, he, we've he got a jog we, slowly. <laughs> take, take your time, Richard. Uh, yeah, we've got another 40 minutes. And if we go over, we can always pop on to another session. But I, I think we'll be all right. So David, tell me a little bit about um, you, you know, you've joined the, the, fa the, the business relatively recently, I guess that now it's what, two, two, three years, two years? So you see it's over four years now. Oh, wow. So, well, who knows? So I left, um, I left Anchor Distilling in, in late 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and came back to Scotland and uh, Richard's not in the room now. He can't hear. Unfortunately, the winter of 2015, his father passed away and that mm -hmm. kind of left the gap in the company. And um, so I was speaking to Michael Urquhart and passing on my condolences and he said, well, where are you? And I said, well, I'm back in the UK. And he said, well, <clears throat> would you consider coming up? So my family live up here. They live in Inverness. And... Um, so I said, sure, why not? And came up. And so great privilege to join a family business. This is actually my uh, 33rd year in the industry. Believe wow. it or not. So having worked for most people to come to Gordon McPhail, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like an aging kind of pro footballer or somebody ending up in a smaller team, but one that you can really feel part of, which is yeah. fantastic. And what I can say in all of my career, I have never come across whiskies and a stock of whiskey. And in fact, to the point when I first went to the warehouse, I, I was really a little bit skeptical that it was true. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then I saw it and I was like, well, okay, they're not faking this. But I was astonished because, you know, particularly things like Glenrothes, for example, you know, we, we have stocks of Glenrothes that Glenrothes don't have. We have stocks of Glenlivet that Glenlivet doesn't have. We, we had stocks of Macallan that Macallan didn't have, and we still have stocks of Macallan. And it, we, we have stocks of product that we're not allowed to sell. Uh, and the reason is that some of the big multinationals can't afford to buy back the stock from production that we would just mm. give, we would sell it back to them and they could market it. But they don't want us to sell it either because it's older and rarer stock than they have. So you'll sometimes see sub brands that we do like mcphail's and mm -hmm. mcphail's is a brand where we put things that maybe we can't talk about too much so if you ever mm. see a bottle of mcphail's knocking around i would seriously suggest you look at it because it will be something rare and sherried and very famous that we can't talk about wow so, it's, it, it, so it is like joining um a, it's almost like joining a museum or a library rather than right. a business. right and, um a lot of fun but, but seriously, we've got over 100 distilleries uh, still in the warehouse, um, closed distilleries, famous distilleries, not so famous distilleries. I think there's some things that we will be really promoting that will change the fortunes of those distilleries over time. They've been mm. left behind, forgotten. Uh, and it's, it's all down to this 
weird maturation thing that went on. George Urquhart, which would be Richard's grandfather, Mr. George, and you'll see the Mr. George um, release, which is available in the States. Mm -hmm. um, Charlie McLean looked at it, and I, I'm very good friends with Charlie, and there's no, there's no bullshit filter either way. And he said to me, honestly, that's probably the best whiskey I've ever tasted in my life. And, wow. you know, I'm, I'm not bonus. I'm not a shareholder. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it's like it doesn't mean anything to me if it's the best or not. Um, makes it slightly easier to sell if he says that. But other than that. Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah there's some it, it's it's got a slight magic to it. It's not corporate. Mm. It's very, you heard that in Richard, didn't you, when he was explaining about his family? He he's just, you know, you, you, where do you find that? You probably find that with Glenn Farkless. Um, you know, they've still got that real family ethos, but you don't see it very often. And I know pretty much everybody in the industry these days. So it's, um, yeah, great place to be. And, um, and the other thing that is, is really interesting is that they, they don't really want to work with big, um, with big retailers particularly. They're much more interested mm. in working with independents because it takes an independent retailer with the level of knowledge and expertise to be able to explain the concept. Yeah. You know, the big guys haven't got the time or the energy to do the hand and sell, which is what, what it requires. You know, well, and also, also you, you know, you guys have a lot of whiskey and a lot of rare whiskey, but in the grand scheme of things, 16,000 casks, that's not that much. You know, you, 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 you unleash that and it's gone in a set. I mean, we, we drink it all. So I, I, I think you have to respect, uh, respect that. And I, I did have a question quickly, you know, the filling contract thing, which, you know, very few people really um, are able to replicate what, what they're doing. How many distilleries right now do you work with directly in that respect? So we're working probably with now with around 50. We're, we're not with everybody. Um, mm -hmm. um, my, my, biggest, my biggest enemy is the new VP of marketing who joins from Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or Procter & Gamble and goes, right. what the hell are you doing selling stock to these guys? Yeah. Uh, and he's, he's my biggest potential enemy. And by the way, I was that guy once. I remember going into, uh, you know, I was in the Midwest and I went into Binnie's inevitably as you do, even in those days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they had a 2008 Glen Rothis at $29.99. And we just repackaged the Glen Rothis into the dumpy little pack you see today. And I wanted it to be at thirty nine ninety nine. That was the, 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 that was where I wanted it to be. I mean, remember those days? Yeah, right? yeah. And, um, I, and I had a massive falling out. Um, not that that's a unique experience in Binnies, I have to tell you, over the years. But <laughs> I, it wasn't a particularly constructive meeting with Brett. And, um, and I was like, what, you know, WTF with these guys, Gordon McPhail, being cheapest on display. Why would you do that with a quality of liquid? And, and so one of the things I have done, I'm sorry to all you consumers out there, is I've had to say we're no, no longer doing 29.99 whiskeys. Apologies. But if we've already got 16,000 casks, you know, I'll leave that to maybe to Diageo and some of the bigger guys. Yeah, and I think you guys are able to still offer incredible value for, for what you are doing. I mean, you know, we're not only on the Ben Romack line where you're obviously fully in control uh, and, and there, you know, um, we see some really special juice getting put out at a, at a very reasonable price, but also on the, uh, you know, on, uh, on the various, uh, you know, the, the distillery labels, you know, even those, even though those coming in a slightly higher pot price, it's not like we can get more lock 25 anywhere close to that from the distillery. And, you know, you still have that cool old label and it's, it's a, I mean, you're offering a lot of value there and I, I think deservedly so, you know, you, you don't need to undercut yourself for well, sure. I mean, for example, this is a, a Glen Rothes 11 that I've got here. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that would be, that would be a $50 bottle in the States. Um, it's a first fill sherry. Um, and it's, yeah. you know, what's not to like about a first fill sherry uh, 86 proof at 50 bucks, you know, and that's that's making you a margin, the wholesaler a margin, and giving and giving good value. So, yeah. I, you know, I've tried to bring a little bit of realism to the business in the sense of, you know, listen, value is that is you know this better than me, but value is a combination of quality and price. And mm -hmm. I think if somebody's getting something special, they're okay paying for it. 
we don't tend to charge for packaging. You know, we don't tend to do that. I, I've been a bit concerned um, about some of our competitors who've, they've really gone crazy on the packaging and it's almost like, well, what are you paying for glass and what are you paying for, for whiskey? And yeah. I, I, I think, you know, now and again, listen, you want something special and there's been some great, you know, examples of, of, of innovative packaging. But fundamentally, most of the people I've met are interested in what's in the glass. And I was the back of the wine guys, you know, if you buy a first growth bottle of claret at Bordeaux, it's in a pretty similar pack to a, to a regular bottle of wine, right? No doubt. Uh, you just want effective packaging. Well, and, and to be how honest, how do guys feel about packaging? How does it, how does the market? You know, I think it's, it's, as you get more into it, it becomes less and less important. Sure. Um, and, and if you talk to any collector, they'll tell you straight up, you know, it's not the glass that appreciates that if you you can put something in a thousand dollar decanter and if it's junk nobody's gonna pay a thousand dollars even for the glass because well, you know you got a dirty glass so uh you know i i think um i think you know first and foremost it needs to be great great juice uh and that's what people are after and if you can put it in an attractive packaging all the better i will say you know most guys you know they want a few trophy bottles to put on the shelf and never drink and, um, you know, that's not really our, we're not, I mean, of course, we'll sell those super high end things and, you know, when we can get them. Um, but that's not really our focus. Um, we're not a, we're not a, you know, we're not a hyper premium establishment white glove. You know, we want people buying and drinking and, and buying a, buying another one. That's why we're, we're buying casks and trying to, you know, move a, a barrel of Klein leech. Why not? Why not? Why, Why not? not? Instead of uh, say, sell three bottles, let's sell 300. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different model. Of course, there are stores that really, really thrive on that, that side of the business. Um, but I think uh, the real collectors understand that it starts in the bottle and uh, everything outside is, is, is secondary. And, and as you said, there are a number of producers who, 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 who haven't quite figure that out they figure if they just throw some 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 okay juice in a very fancy crystal decanter you know everything is gonna be fine you're like well i have no way of selling that at five or six hundred dollars a bottle no i think that's i think i think that's probably quite right now i wonder if i if my if my mind tells me that richard may be in place by now great you, you want to see if you can yeah, yeah, I'm going to connect with him. Go back to Richard and see how he's doing. Yeah, it's great talking to you, David. Okay, good to talk to you. Speak to you a little bit later. Yeah. A, a seamless Hi, transition. Hey. Yeah. Hey. I'm ready and waiting. Oh, I can't believe we're doing this. This is so yeah. cool. So in the, in the warehouse, sorry, it's been an echo, but we have three parts to our warehouse. We have the large racked warehouse, the small mm -hmm. racked warehouse, and then we've got a Dunnage warehouse style kind of um, upstairs. So we'll do a few, little bit of time down here, then I'll take you upstairs to see the, the warehouse that you've seen most of our promotional photographs. Very cool. So, so most of, we built this warehouse back in the 1960s, and this is where we store all the old whiskies and also the whiskies we plan to bottle in the next 12 months. So it's very much, um, you'll see quite a lot of hidden gems here, <laughs> uh, but there'll be some young whiskies here as well. So ten, the way we tend to work is we will leave whiskey on site as early as wherever possible, and then one year before we're due to bottle it, we'll bring it back to Elgin so we can grade it, check it to what we expect. We do usually get what we expect because we do put a lot of time and effort in sourcing the right types of casks. Right. Um, as a business, we would... We used to bottle sherry um, from bodegas in Spain, and that's why some of our relationships with bodegas go back over 100 years. So the main kind of historic bodega we work with is called Williams and Humbert. Mm -hmm. We work with two other ones just now, or two other cooperages just now, the Battle and also uh, a company called Wampino. But Williams and Humbert we've been working with for over 100 years. Wow. Um, we bottle the sherry, effectively get the casks, and then we use those casks for uh, single malt whiskey. So. I'm guessing you'd rather see some casks rather than see me. So I'm going to turn the camera <laughs> around and we'll start the kind of walk through. And so, if you have any, yeah. 
Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. So because you guys are using such good wood and, and, uh, and you know the, the quality of the spirit that's going in there, you're able to be pretty hands off on a lot of things. I assume that you spend a lot of time um, making sure the quality is good. But oh, my God, look at that. Look at those beautiful old cherry bats in 1951. Um, are you, are you, I, I, you probably have all your old, your oldest stock in, the, in these warehouses, correct? Yeah, we've got some yeah. at Benoma as well now because we don't want it all in the same place, but all the right. old casts tend to be in our own locations that we have. So we've got quite a few warehouses up at Benoma now as well. Wow, so look at that. These are all That's from it. the 50s, Glen Grant 51, but we don't just have one. We've got another one just sitting there as well, cast Beautiful. number 111, cast number 99. You can see these are all first fill casts because it's all that kind of wood end, so there's no yeah. painting on these ones at all. This one does have a painted end, but this is a 1954 um, Glenlivet, J. G. Smith, which you'd probably recognize from some of our old distillery label bottoms that you have as well. So this would have been a refill cask back in 54. And so presumably this, this, this would have come from a sherry that was vinified even decades before that, perhaps. Perhaps. I mean, uh, these days we have the full details of all our casks and we know all the history behind them, but we've got ledges that go back that far, but we wouldn't have the same detail about what each cask was used for beforehand. Wow. Um, just to correct myself, that's not actually the cask number. This is actually cask 3203, 2763. That mm. must be the how much was filled into the casks. Wow. We've got some ca casks from the 40s here as well. Those Again, must have been imperial gallons then, are we talking? Yeah, or, I would guess so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is 1948 wow. Glen Grant. Again, you see that. And I mean, not to like monetize this, but something, but, but a cast like that, I mean, is worth these. I mean, obviously Glen Grant can't afford to buy these from you, probably, I, I'd imagine. Uh, th these, are, these, are, these are real treasures here. Um, do you have a, already have a plan for where where these will go, or are you just simply waiting to see what makes sense for them? Oh, look at that! Is so that Strathila? Oh no, Glenlivet. Yeah, no, it's Strathila. So it back in the back in the day when Glenlivet was like the region. So there's right. only one the Glenlivet distillery, but Glenlivet covered many distilleries. Even Ben Omer was Ben Omer Glenlivet um, right. traditionally as well. So this is a Strathila 1957. Amazing. The interesting one about this distillery is we actually tried to buy this distillery back in 1950. Um, the owner had gone bankrupt and it went to auction and we were one of, one of the last bidders on it, but it obviously got purchased by that small company, well, obviously not a small company, but Chivas Brothers acquired it. <laughs> um, Just a little local yeah. company. Uh, yeah, that's, but this that's a cask, very cool distillery too. I like Strathila a lot. Look how thick that, that yeah. those stays are. So this are. is one of the old transportation casks that we sometimes talk about in tastings mm -hmm. where the stays are thicker so it wouldn't actually burst or break in transit. And these casks are the ones that are being matured for a great length of time because they give an extra barrier so you get that slower maturation and it retains the volume and the strength um, compared to some of the other casks that we have here, which again, that's a quite a thick one. Mm -hmm. Some of the younger casks we maybe see upstairs, again, would be slightly thinner. And that's a different type of evaporation we get from those casks. Interesting. And do you, do you make a distinction between these traveling sherries in terms of quality, the traveling sherry casks, which would have been brought to the UK and then consumed and bottled there uh, with like, you know, a bota or like a, you know, a true end of, you know, Solera end cask where you have like the etchings of the you know the the yeah the producer on there i mean is is there a huge difference in terms of character between those those two styles or are we you know do you find that the traveling sherry and the, and the and the the bodega sherries are are similar so what we tend to find with some of the transportation casks is they're actually american oak so you get that kind of lighter more tropical flavor profile with mm -hmm. a lot of the so if you look at our portfolio a lot of the whiskeys from the 40s are not the darkest whiskies. They're actually quite light. And whiskies mm. from the 50s are actually some really dark colors we get coming through there. And that's the difference between that kind of more transportation, thicker staves, and then also um, 
that kind of buying casks, which are European oak that have been using a solar system, um, mm -hmm. which gives it that much darker, richer color. But these days, a lot of the casks we buy or we get, we don't, we get made to our specification are um, they're seasoned casks. So we have to specify what goes into them. Mm -hmm. We have to specify um, how long they're seasoned for. So the moment we will season our sherry butts for at least two years, mm -hmm. we will specify if they're European or, or American oak, um, and we'll get them produced by about two companies. So we've got right. enough supply coming through. And then our sherry hogsheads will be um, matured and um, seasoned for at least two years. So and this is an old sorry, Benoma cask. Yeah, an old Benoma cask. So this is an 81 cask. Um, so this is stock um, that we probably acquired when we bought the distillery. We've got two types of old stock from Benoma. Some of the stuff that we filled ourselves to mm -hmm. go into Gold McPhail's Conscious Choice. And then we've got stock that we've acquired when we bought the distillery in 1993. So this is um, a couple of old Benoma casks just here as well. Do, do you ever get an opportunity to buy, I know you're, you know, you, you, you feel so much, you need, you know, consistent specifications, but do you ever get an opportunity to buy older sherry butts where they're saying, hey, we've got this extra five barrels, you know, that have been in a Solera for 50 years, like, is, is that a thing still? Or is it more just, yeah. okay, we're, we got well, these, these seasoned ones? Up to this year, we still would buy a percentage of ex Solera, ex Bodega casks but we're not able to get any at the moment at all. So oh, we wow. can't rely on the consistency. So if you speak to my brother, he is very much involved in that process. He will talk very a lot about the consistency, the wood we get and the quality of it by specifying the oak type, what goes into it, um, just to give us the right um, quality of whiskey going forward. Right. Ex XLR, we get a bit more kind of variety and flavor profiles. So we have to try and um, get balance. I mean, It'll be interesting to see if the whiskeys in 50, 60, 70 years time taste like whiskeys from 70 years ago right. using those older style casks. But we'll just have to wait 70 years and find out. So, <laughs> That's the plan. I'm going yeah. I'm I'm to plan to be there. Uh, this is so, so cool, man. So this is, unfortunately, I can't get down to the bottom of that cask warehouse, but we'll see more casks when we go upstairs. But this Great. cask, this racked warehouse um, can store roughly about 6,000 casks. And... Wow is usually pretty much um, full, just so um, with casts, either we're keeping for long, for, for what my grandfather called overaging, or mm. for stuff we'll plan to bottle in the next 12 months. It's awesome. And this is the what? mini racked warehouse. So this is a smaller warehouse. And this is mm -hmm. where we, we've got some Ledeg Hermitage finish up there. Nice. So that, watch out in a couple of years, that'll be coming out Very in cool. Glasser. Tomatin, Little Mill. Oh, hello. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Those, those, those old nut and Little Mills can be quite good. Um, we've, we've bottled a couple over the years. We had one on Fault Line, the 91, that was very, very good. I, I wonder, so your batches are, you know, pretty small. I mean, we're talking, you know, what, five, ten for, for something like a Connoisseur's batch, a batch of con uh, on the Connoisseur's line. How many barrels would you pick for, for, for a product like that, typically? So majority of Conscious Choice bottlings now are single casks. So they'll oh, just okay. be individuals. Right. Um, but when we do a batch, um, we do some 46% bottlings. And they could be two casks, four casks, five casks. They still would be quite small batches. Typically, our batches would be, for batch products, between 10 and 40 casks. Wow. So this, yeah. So we use racking here. So... If, if we do a tour of Benomic at some point in the future, you'll see that we just use Dunwich warehouses at Benomic. So this is actually mm -hmm. a different style of warehouse we use here. Yeah. And this has been where we've been since the 1960s. What's the humidity like in the, in, I mean, you guys are very near the ocean. I imagine it's pretty humid, in, but it, it is a drier style warehouse compared to a Dunwich, no? Yeah, um, here we get quite a big kind of variance between the bottom and the top of the racked warehouse. Mm. So it's definitely cooler at the bottom. And in the summer, we get quite a big variance of temperature. So te technically, if you were trying to be smart, you'd have all the younger whiskeys at the top, all the old whiskeys at the bottom to try and make sure we... Um, so apologies, I can't get further down just now, but you can see it's just a big racked warehouse full of nice aging whiskey. Great. That will be, um, yeah. Gorgeous, man. This so, is so cool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect just for a few minutes, run upstairs, and I will run this time. So I'll re reconnect when I'm back into that <laughs> kind of 
Dunnage Warehouse right we have upstairs. Right on. Okay. All right. I'll be I'll back with you very shortly. Okay. Cheers. Bye. Well, that's pretty cool. We don't see uh, we don't see cast that old very often. Um, there and certainly not in such great qualities. You know, if we if we walk through the signatory warehouses, we'll be shocked to see something from the seventies, maybe the sixties, but um, and and it'll be one or two barrels here or there. And of course, they don't roll out all their gems for us, but um, it's pretty incredible that you know Gordon McPhail has really nothing to hide there and everybody knows they have these incredible whiskeys um and it's not just the old whiskeys you know they have they have they have stocks that very very few people have um we are you know always looking for single casts from these guys uh i hope we have time to talk about it but we're evaluating right now uh 2000 mortlock refill sherry hogshead beautiful not too dark but very very flavorful uh, this 2006 Klein Leash. We're hoping to get pricing on these soon. This, I was surprised to see a Scapa. We don't see a whole lot of Scapa 2000 Refill Sherry Butt. Um, and then we did just buy this monster, 2001 Kalila. So that is definitely coming. It's a uh, 19-year-old Kalila um, bottled by Gordon McPhail. Cast rank single barrel. Oh, it's so good. And it is, oh, Richard's back. Um, it is spectacular and very, very reasonably priced considering how difficult it is to get peated whiskey. And here he is. Okay, we're upstairs now. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll just let you hand around this warehouse. So this is the warehouse where we do quite a lot of photography. It's a yes. very small warehouse at the top. But this is where you'll see a lot of the family photographs being taken. And we've got lots of different stuff up here, which is quite unique. And we've got some young whiskies. So Ben Romer is maturing in the back there. And we've got some Mortlark, Kalilas, Linkwoods. Beautiful. You can see them. Oh, yeah. Wow. Some St. Magdalene I, back there. I love these attic warehouses. Like, there's something in Scotland, you know, we, we think of it as always those dusty, low uh, stone warehouses. But actually, there are some people, that, you're not the only ones who do this sort of upstairs warehousing in the Dunnage style. I think it's so cool. Uh, yeah. There we go. Look at that. So in the future, we probably won't have this warehouse because we'll be moving casts over to Ben Omerk. Mm -hmm. This is um, it's so nice to have it while we're here. Yeah, yeah, because it's so difficult to 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 utilize. Um, it's just we all purpose-built warehouses, which will um, give us the same capacity and the same way of storing whiskey without having it upstairs, and it'll right. give us more more room for production. Because as no, we grow Ben Omerk and as we but we need a distillery. We'll need a bit more capacity for bottling whiskey than we've had in the past. What's the name of the new distillery? Um, it's still going through a few kind of um, trademark checks. So hopefully, in the next couple of months, we'll be able to come out and tell you what it is. Great. But it's um, we've got the name. We're just going through the final stages of checking. Of course. If I won't. I won't press you on it. Can't yeah. wait to hear. Look at that. That's what a fifty-eight Strathila. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. Linkwood. These two casts, we do have a couple of casts up here which are casts that we have bottled. So the two here is a 1961 Longmorn, cast 512, and a Longmorn 1961. So these two are actually bottled. And this is two casts I bottled with my brother a couple of years ago. It's part of our private collection range. So these are casts that were filled on the same day. Um, one is European oak and one is American oak. And they were matured side by side for their entire lives. Wow. Um, and there's a way of looking at twins and looking at nature versus nurture and seeing how the cast type <laughs> took the same liquid and you got two different products at the end. So, Very yeah. cool. That is so fun. And so those those are already bottled. Are you going to refill the casks or what are you going to do? Or just keep no, them they've, they've done their, done their hard, hard, hard job. Work. They've been, yeah, they've been um, matured whiskey for over 50 years, so we wouldn't tend to refill them. So our wood policy is these days to only use a cast maximum twice but we will monitor the lifespan as well. Right. Typically, these, well, technically, these are first fill casks, but we wouldn't actually make them second fill because they've actually matured whiskey for longer than we would normally Yeah, mature whiskey for. Yeah. Very cool. So, Beautiful. So that's, uh, obviously, we've got some whiskey to talk you through when we get back across to next door. Um, so, yeah, thank you for 
joining me in our first ever virtual oh my gosh, warehouse tour. So cool. It almost feels like I'm back in Scotland. I I'm I'm giddy. I just this is the best. Thank you so much, Richard, for your time. So for me it's very much it's a great privilege. I mean these casts were filled by my great grandfather, my grandfather, this cast filled wow. by my dad, my uncles, and my generation and everybody else who works in the business today. So it really much is something that we have to add more into in the future so we can yeah. keep filling more whiskey into this warehouse for oh. 10, we're 20, so, 30, 40 years time. We're so honored to be part of this. And, and you know, we're going to keep pushing to make sure that those those warehouses get filled, man. So thank yeah. you again. Uh, are you okay. are we going to pop back over to David now? Or what do you think? Yeah, we'll pop back to David and he'll okay. start talking about some whiskey and I'll go and join him in a few minutes time. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. All right, that was pretty cool. I think everybody can agree. Um, not so often that we get to uh, traipse around the warehouses like that. It's almost like you guys are part of the show with me here. A Morrow guy knows. Let's see, where is David? Uh, 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 Mr. King, are you here? Are you here? Um, anyhow. This has been pretty cool. We, have, we only have a few minutes left. Let me see if I can get David back on. Um, we've got a ton of great whiskeys coming from uh, Gordon McPhail this year and David King. Uh, I hope everybody can, oh well, whatever. It'll probably pop up soon enough. I hope everybody can get a taste of these. The other one, I don't know. I, can't, I like can't believe that we're getting it. But uh, we did buy a 21-year-old uh, Macallan refill sherry hogshead, um, which, you know, if it was bottled by the distillery, would be thousands of dollars. And, uh, and it's going to be like... Mr. King, where are you, brother? Um, so that's happening. This uh, this incredible Kalila, which I just I have to taste. I don't know where David is, but um, I'm going to drink it. Uh, it's almost ten o'clock, so it's good good time to start tasting whiskey. Uh, I like tasting whiskey in the morning. It's a it's a good way to start the day. Um, and oh yeah, yeah, this Kalila. You know, this is almost 20-year-old Kalila. We've had trouble getting old Isla, period, um, from any of our suppliers. We'll be lucky to get a 10-year-old. Um, we actually, we have secured two 10-year-old. Um, there we go. Uh, two 10-year-old uh, Kalilas as well. I mean, Kalila is such an underrated distillery. People don't talk about it enough. Um, and this one, this, I mean, it won't be inexpensive, of course, but uh, we, we think it's totally worth the money, less than 200 bucks. Mm, wow. It's got everything you want, Kalila. That lemon zest, that salted fish. Very like a pure smoke, pure like white, almost like camphor. Mm. Oh God, that's so good. Um, and, and, and Chuck is noting there is still a, a few bottles of the Kalila 50 year available if anybody wants to ball out of control as we did, as we say. Um, so, you know, just hit me up if you're, if you're feeling saucy. Um, that said, oh, here he is, Mr. King. Oh, Richard's back. Beautiful. Uh, whoops, go live. Um, Richard, I'm, I've been drinking without you. I apologize. Um, and hopefully we're back. This... Mm, wow. It's a lot of whiskey. 
it's going, it's going. Connecting, no, is it happening? Well, anyway, if it does, it does. This has already been one of the coolest we've ever done, so I'm pretty happy. And these whiskeys are ridiculously good. Oh, I've just sprayed some on my shirt. Oh well. I want everybody to notice my, my wife's beautiful fall bouquet, little tiny pumpkins. They fit perfectly with the Ben Romack theme. Uh, Richard, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that again. Uh, ba, 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 request, request, add. Maybe we'll get a couple minutes to say goodbye here. Um, eh, it's not happening, whatever, it's cool. We're loose. Uh, I think I'm gonna try this scapa now. Oh, here we go, here we go. Come on down. Oh, you're both coming on. I'm, I'm gonna try David, see if his connects. Oh, there we go. I think we broke Instagram. We broke it. We broke it. It's too exciting. So, so I gather I'm missing out on your amazing tasting of liquids and also <laughs> your wife's rather amazing bouquet. Isn't that gorgeous? It's Look at that. And you know, I once saw a tasting note which said this product reminds me of um, Carmen Miranda's hat, which <laughs> doesn't, look, doesn't look dissimilar. <laughs> to your wife's full bouquet back then. It's perfect. The perfect the perfect tasting note. I didn't think it existed, but now here it is. Uh, well, we don't have very much time, David, so I don't know how much whiskey we can taste, but uh, is there something you want to highlight before we go? Do you know, um, I'll tell you what I have got here. Um, I've got one thing. I think you've been talking about these... Uh, these distillery labels, yeah. Oh yeah, that's my that's my honey, that's my baby yeah. right there. So this is um, obviously uh, I like to call this Gordon McPhail taming the beast, taming the beast of Dufton. Um, there's all sorts of talk about different types of distillation and 2.78 and all the rest of it, but actually um, this is a great example of what Gordon McPhail does. It takes a great distillate, matures it really well for 25 years. And then mm. turns it into a product which is just absolutely delightful at yeah. a great price compared to the distillery bottling. Yeah. You know, and that kind of sums it up. Um, yeah. Great, great, great distillate. The, the, you know, Maltlick does great. Um, but what Gordon McPhail does with the maturation process just has a little bit of magic. And then we're able to uh, maybe not pay the brand tax because we just don't have these huge A&P budgets to worry well, about. Well, I also think you guys, you kind of, in a lot of ways, you challenge these big distillers to do something cool. And, you know, for, for years, this was the only Mortlock we could get. You know, there wasn't Mortlock available. And now they've, they've now gone through two rounds of, of, of releases. And no offense to your friends down, down uh, in Dufton, but uh, it's difficult to, to match what you, what you all have put in the bottle there. It's, it's so pretty the, special stuff. So the company philosophy has always been to complement, not to compete. Yeah. So you'll find that if somebody's doing vintages, we'll tend to do years old. If they're doing NAS, we'll, we'll put an age statement on it. Um, if they're doing a particular finish, we probably won't compete in that way. So what mm. we're always trying to do to the distilleries is say, look, we'll take your product and do something a little bit different with it. And then you're right. I think it has challenged quality. I think, I think it's challenged wood policy a lot for people. Mm. I think we've really said to people, look, you know what? If you put this liquid into really good wood, look what can be achieved. Yeah. And they've yeah. had to rise to that challenge. And I think that's been a big, big contribution that G&M have made to the general standards. Whiskey, whiskey today is better than it was 30-odd years ago. I don't care what anybody says. Um, 30 odd years ago, the majority of people were distilling for blends. When I joined, yeah. when I joined the industry, 92% of the market globally was blends, 8% was single malt. Today, 26% of the market is single malt by value. In terms of value or volume? Value, by value. value. Yeah. And you know what that shows is that people are drinking maybe a little bit less but they're certainly drinking a lot better. And I think that's yeah. got to be good for everybody. Oh, yeah. um, and, that, and that's the interest, you know, and I, you know, don't get me wrong. I made most of my career selling J and B and Cuddy Sark, but it was always interesting back in the J and B days. If you wanted 90 cases of J and B, you had to take 10 cases of Nakando. 
Oh, we still get that. Oh my God, we, we, David, we only have 10 more seconds. Do you want to come back on and chat, chat a little bit more after this? Sure, happy to do right. that if people would like to. Cool, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna start.